Hey, what's up, Impact? It is so good to see you. You guys excited to be here at least? All right, good, good. Hey, real quick, I got to share something with you. This month is my favorite month, believe it or not. Well, kind of. Something absolutely electric happens this month. Come on, you heard it. What is it? It's March, St. Patrick's Day. March Madness. I love March Madness. Do you love March Madness? It is so good. Actually, I was thinking about it, and I was like, why is it that we love March Madness? Why is it that I will watch game after game after game? It's because the reality is you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, who was it last year? St. Peter's? Come on, dog. St. Pe- Dude, they beat Purdue first round. I'm a Purdue fan. I was hurt. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but it's an, it's an underdog month is what it is. We love a good underdog story. Even the movies. I want to list some underdog movies for you. Maybe you've seen them. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. You can agree with me. Say they're great. I don't know. Rudy. Rudy, right? Some of you guys are like, what is Rudy? It's a Notre Dame movie. I'm not a Notre Dame fan, but it's a great movie. How about Rocky? Rocky's a great, that's a classic. And it's not just that. You got Rocky 2. And you got Rocky 3. And you got 4. Believe it or not, there's a 5, but not many people know that. It's not, and then you got Creed, yeah. Hear me out. One of the greatest <laughs> underdog movies of all time. Kung Fu Panda. Dude, I'm saying. I'm saying. Kung Fu Panda. If you say it's not, go home, watch it, text me, hit me back, and then you'll say it is. Like I said, it's an underdog month. We love a good underdog story. And you may see where this is going, but I believe that one of the greatest underdog stories is actually David and Goliath. Believe it or not, it is. And when we read the story, it's actually such an iconic story that we use it to describe any moment a small team or person or individual can overcome just crazy odds, right? I was scrolling Instagram, and actually I saw like a reference to David and Goliath on ESPN's Instagram. It showed all these underdog teams, and the title, the headline was Giant Killers. You may have saw it. I don't know. And I was just like, well, that's convenient. I'm going to use that Wednesday. So Giant Killers. And David and Goliath, it's an iconic story for a reason, rightfully so. And I believe many of us, maybe some of us are like, oh, here we go. David and Goliath, I've heard the story since I, if you've been alive, you've heard this story. But I want to challenge your perspective tonight. And so in this story, what we will see, the writer in this text does what is rarely done in all of Hebrew scripture. It prolongs the story to actually draw out details, emotion. It highlights varies individual things so that it can draw us in and as much as we use it for the little beating the big we can miss the very heart of this story and I don't want to do that tonight because the story is far greater than just an underdog story and so I want to set the scene with you if you have your Bibles you can open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 2 through 3 we'll see this unfold It says this, and it'll also be on the screen. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Allah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. So the scene is you have God's chosen people on a hill. Then you have the Philistines who are actually invading and want to overcome them. They're on the other hill and there's this valley, this battleground right between The Philistines were the opponent of the Israelites. And it's important to highlight this, that Israel, the Israelites, were God's chosen people. Chosen by God himself to do amazing things. God was on their side. The Lord of angel armies was for them. And God told them, I am going to bless you so that you can actually be a blessing to the world. Their job was to listen to God and then extend the name of God out to the nations. They have a lot of things going for them. And if this was me, I would say, man, I have all the confidence in the world, or I would like to think so. If God gave me all these things, I would say, man, I can take anyone, right? I think you would do the same if God said, actually, I'm going to bless you. I want to use your nation. I want to use you. I think we'd have some confidence. You would think the same would be for them. But then something happens in verse 4. 
It's out of the camp of the Philistines comes a champion. And his name is Goliath. We've heard of him before, maybe. If not, I'm going to describe him. But before that, the word champion, it's actually a weird word. And it's actually the only place it's actually used. The Hebrew word here for champion is a combination of two words. The combination is actually man in between. Meaning that a man would step between these two armies. It was the representative of the Philistines deciding to step out. The champion was someone who would leave the body and they would go in the valley and say, here I am. I am the champion for my people. Instead of having everyone, the battle was different then. Instead of having everyone shed blood in battle, there would be one man that would fight on the behalf of the people. That man, Goliath. And he is huge, a monster, okay? He was about nine feet, nine inches tall, roughly around there. And I want to read you his description briefly. It's 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7. It says, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin that was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. What is so interesting here is the Bible is so descriptive describing him. Why? It is to feel what the Israelites were feeling in this moment. It is to draw us in. To realize what they were going up against. That the man is actually big. He's intimidating. When you read this, you're like, man, I, I, this is just, I, I'm kind of scared too. Goliath would come out every day and shout and mock the people of God. Causing a deep-rooted fear in the hearts of the Israelites. Not only did he look scary, he talked scary. He stood and shouted to the people of Israel in verse 8. This is what he says. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? He says, choose a man and have him come down to me. It's a bold statement. Goliath is literally calling them out. He's saying, here I am. Send out your man. Let your man step out here and represent you. He's saying, if he loses... You all lose. But if he wins, you're all victorious. Same for us. He's saying, send in a hero that will stand in for you. Give me a champion. This is what Goliath does. And not only does he do that, but he actually begins to curse the people of God. And in verse 10, he also says, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Can you imagine hearing these words for a minute? A man of this stature calling out you. How will the people of God respond? The people God chose to accomplish his purposes. These aren't just people that are just like, I don't even know where I'm going. Who's this guy? Like, these people were God's chosen people. The blessing was on them. How would they respond? You would think they'd say, hey, let's go, let's ride. Like, like, it's like, Goliath, give me a break. Say, have you seen my God? Maybe you would say that. How would they respond? They wouldn't do that. Actually, in verse 11, it says, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul, their leader, and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. There was fear in the hearts of God's chosen people. Personally, they sound like me my freshman year of high school. Some of your freshmen are like, uh-oh. My freshman year, I kid you not. I said, listen, I played quarterback. That's all I wanted to do. But I wanted to make the varsity team, so I told my coach I was a punter. So I'll just go kick it. You know what I mean? We got two, like, junior, senior punters. It's fine. I'll go out and kick a ball, whatever. I'm never going to play. I just want to dress. Punter goes down. Number two punter goes down. Dude wasn't even a punter. And then there was me, freshman year. I remember he said, Burns, you're in. You got to go punt. I'm like, dude, I've never punted in my life. 
I look at my friend, dude, and I said, dude, I need your gloves. I need your helmet. I need your extra knee pads. I am scared. I actually put his gloves on, and I took one of the senior's helmets that was on the bench. I said, in case I get smoked, I need something that's serious. I can't be, I was scared, petrified. I went in there, and I was just like, dude, I kicked it so far out of bounds. Like, it wasn't even close. And I had to tell the coach, you know, I throw things. I don't kick things. That's just how it is. I was terrified. It was deep in my heart. What I said I would do, I, I was scared. And here is Saul, the man who was supposed to lead them in confidence to follow the Lord, is cowering in fear. And all the people, they're like, we're in a bad spot. So the main question, their leader is scared, the people are scared, and here stands Goliath. Who will we send out? It's a big question. They're all about to be overcome. And it's actually the most unlikely David. The one who was overlooked, not thought of to be a hero. In verses 17 through 19, it actually gives us a description of what was happening before he went out. And in verse 18, it'll be on the screen, but I want to read one part. It says, he gets the instruction from his father, take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Allah fighting against the Philistines. Talk about unlikely. This man is on a cheese run. Okay? Pepper Jack for you. Sharp cheddar. That's what he's doing. He's delivering cheeses, man. Unlikely. He's the youngest. But David shows up, says, okay, and he begins to hear the Philistine yelling. And the story says that David heard Goliath shouting, cursing God. And David actually, it's very interesting, asks a question, and it's an unlikely question. He hears these people yelling. And in verse 26, this is the question. David said, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? He says, when he goes down, what do we receive here? If you notice, he doesn't say, how are you going to take this giant down? He didn't say, what will this man do for us or to us? He didn't say, did you see his size? No, he says, hey, actually, when he goes down, like, what's the word? He says it boldly, knowing that the battle was already won. David wasn't concerned with the battle. The battle was won, knowing the promises of God, knowing that God was fighting for them even in the midst of their fears and doubt. But there's a part of the story that I don't want us to miss. And it's actually not the fight. And we can get fixated on the fight, but it's actually the speech right before. David's speech is longer than the battle. Because the speech was the point. And I want to read you the speech in verse 47. It says, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Did you notice? Six times he mentions the Lord. And only the Lord. The speech really comes down to this. The Lord will fight. It's the Lord's battle. And the Lord will get the glory. David is saying, listen, it's not me who fails to understand what you have. It's you who fails to understand what I have. I'll say it again. It's not me who fails to understand what you have, Goliath. It's you who fails to understand what I have. Who's fighting on my behalf? Because it was the Lord's battle, not David's. And I believe we just tend to say, oh man, David did this incredible thing. Yeah, he walked out there in boldness. But it was the Lord's battle. 
And for you tonight, I don't know what battles that we are facing. I understand that a lot of us come in here with a lot of battles, some bigger than others. Maybe it's anger. You're angry everywhere you go. You're like, I, I just, I'm fighting this anger battle all the time. Or maybe it's anxiety. Or maybe it's social rejectment. You don't want to be rejected by your friends or you go to school. Or maybe you just feel so unloved that no one has ever looked at you and actually meant that I love you. It's a battle within yourself. There's a lot of battles, but maybe we have tried to make everything our battle, our fight, and not even realize it. How long have we been trying to make this our fight? We scream and yell, I'm going to fight my way out. With my strength, I'm going to fight my way. I'll just keep telling myself I'm loved. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not angry. And we suppress it with our own strength. My strength, my strength, my strength. But David says, the Lord, the Lord, Jesus. Because he knew the battle was not his. He could not do it. His mind and his heart was dwelling in the presence of the Lord. You remember last week, the description of David. It was that David was a man after God's own heart. Not his own heart. That was where the victory was. We are to take our biggest fears, our biggest stresses, our biggest giants, and not ignore them or try and fight them with all of our might and fleshly strength. The Lord is saying, I fight on your behalf. To sit in his presence and be made new to cast your giants onto him. I believe we know how this story goes. The story goes on after this that David would then sprint at Goliath, pull out a stone, and sling it at Goliath. And the story says that the stone hits him and he falls, and David runs over there and stands triumphant over the great threat to God's people. The Lord had conquered the great Goliath through David. I think we can misunderstand this. I ask, have we bought this simply fleshly underdog mentality that this story is if if we just fight with all of our might and sling our stone as hard as we can, all of our giants will fall. They'll just go away. Are Are we buying the story that if we just continue to motivate ourselves and feel inspired, our giants will fall? Is the story nothing more than a big pump up speech in the locker room? You hear it all the time. It's a David and Goliath story. Back in Rap Trip 2017, I think I may have gave one of the best pump-up speeches I think I've ever given. We had this one guy, I love him to death, man. He was only about this tall. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. And we, we don't do this anymore. Don't do this this summer. But we had this thing called Rap Trip WWE Smackdown. <laughs> and there was this mat in the lake. And the lake was, oh, you didn't really want to get in there. It's great. Sign up. It's, it's great. And, and, this, and this kid, he's so scared. And he's got his life jacket on. It's three feet of water. And I'm like, listen, bro. I'm like, you can take her. It's this little kid, and this girl stands on the mat, dude, just ready to go, undefeated. Just, and I'm like, dude, she's nothing. She's nothing. You got it, man. You got it. He's like, yeah. Yeah. And we're all like, yeah. And he's inspired. He's like, no one can touch me. Dude gets up there. Girl gets down a three-point stance. I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> he takes off, runs around, I kid you not, picks him up on a sword and hits me with one of these. He gets picked up, looks at me, and I'm like, <laughs> dude gets body slammed, and she's like, walks out. I've never seen someone so discouraged in their entire life. I don't think he talked the rest of the trip, man. And it was on me. It was on me. And I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you, this sometimes works. A big pump-up speech for a short amount of time. It's the false idea of this story. We'll get so motivated, we'll sling our stone, and yeah, we'll go into everything. Nothing stands against us. We're so motivated, and it works. 
but it's not sustainable. Because then we face serious problems. Serious fears, and our friends actually then maybe even begin to mock our allegiance to Christ. Or our temptations continuously assault us. When certain problems come and they're not easily fixed and suddenly we're less like David and we're more like the Israelites where our fear begins to creep in and and we just feel small and we don't know what to do and we tuck away and all the discouragement and fear and anxiety begins to weigh us down. When all the lust and the sin or anxiety and stress, it begins to mount up against us and we're shattered against the might of our great enemy. We shrink in fear. And the truth is, we aren't so much like David. We're actually more like Israel. The Israelites, powerless. Whatever your biggest fear is, whatever your biggest sin is, we may conquer a hundred enemies in our time, but for many of us, there seems like there's just one that we can't win. Let me tell you something. In the midst of your depravity and helplessness, God does not send a motivational pump-up speech. He doesn't. Read the story. They were quiet. David never showed up and was like, come on, guys, fight harder. Israel, number one, baby. Never happens. God doesn't send a pump-up speech. He sends a substitute. God sends a man between that says, I will step out for you in the valley. I will fight for you. I will do what you cannot do, and my victory will actually count for you, a hero that will fight for you. The reality is your biggest giant, your biggest problem was not anger, fear, or friends not liking us. Sure, those are some giants, but your greatest giant, it was sin and death. All of our fears, whatever they are, the little brothers of the big enemy, Goliath. We were, the, we were the Israelites and we needed a champion. Hell was our Goliath. And we could not beat him. We could not save ourselves. It was too big, too strong. The weight of sin was too powerful. As we talk about this word champion, The deeper layer of this story is that Jesus is our champion. Jesus is our David. The Old Testament points to Jesus all over. Personally, I like to think that one of the primary roles of David's existence was to give us a window into the Messiah that would come. Think of the story. Goliath, nine feet tall. He taunted the people of God, send me a man who will fight with me. In the same way sin taunts humanity today, Jesus' blood doesn't work. I still own you. I'm still the theme of your life. You can't break this addiction, you're mine. But there came an unlikely champion. David. Sent by who? His father. David was doing the will of his father the same way Jesus was on the planet doing the will of his father. David came to the front lines just like Jesus came to the front lines of humanity. And David heard the words of the taunting giant. And the Israelites were so afraid, they saw Goliath and shook with terror. Oh, have you ever shook with terror at your sins and your addictions and said, I will never break this. Verse 48 says that David ran towards the giant. Who is this David who runs with such purpose and mission towards the giant in the same way Jesus came with such purpose and focus to defeat the sin that we could not break down? The story says that the rock hit Goliath straight in the head. David approaches the giant just to ensure that the giant was dead. David severed the head from the body to resemble that sin could not be resuscitated. Sin does not have the resurrection power. And sin has been buried and removed from us as far as the east is from the west if you put your faith in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. It will change the way you live. The Bible says that when the men of Israel saw what David had done, they shouted with great joy. 
Look what has done. Look what has happened. How long have they been quiet? How long have they been silent? How long have you been quiet? The Israelites were scared, but their champion came. And look how they have changed. When they finally realize what their champion has finally accomplished. I understand you may be pushing back. Oh, Tanner, you don't, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know how much sin, how much I've defied God. You don't know the things I've committed. I don't even know if I believe in Jesus, Tanner. Now, hang on. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and standard. You, me, the world. But then my champion, your champion, my David, your David, my Jesus, your Jesus, my king, came and he cut the head of the powers of hell. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You, through Christ Jesus, he says, go live your life. It's free indeed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin. For us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He walked down into the valley and fought the fight that we should have fought. And he won. He won. So tonight, as we go out into the week and we're faced with our giants. Let us remember that Goliath, through the power of the living God, has fallen. And it has no resurrection power on your life. And in Christ, you can handle all the other giants that are in your life because of what Christ has done. That his blood was poured out for you and I. This is not a motivational speech. This is the gospel. Jesus, we thank you that you fought the fight that we should have fought. Lord, we thank you that you give us strength through your spirit, Lord, to face our giants, that even when we fall, Jesus, that you, you just continue to wrap us in your loving arms. Jesus, I pray that we feel just so empowered by you and not our emotion, not by anything else, our own strength, but by you and you alone, that we will walk boldly in the name of you for your glory. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.